And our next speaker is uh, Professor Yuval Portugali. He is um, the director and the head of the ES Lab, the Environmental Simulations Laboratory at Tel Aviv University. And it's hard to say what background Professor Yuval Portugali has because it's a very, very diverse and broad background. There's some geography and some geography training. And in fact, he's also executing his training now as a geographer. There is some planning, uh, so applied, also very much applied work. And I think this morning, uh, you all mentioned, you know, what, okay, what's new in the world here? Uh, we have had some concept about smart cities and, and cities, um, you know, dating back uh, theory, dating back into the 70s. And this is because also you all has shaped these theories back in time uh, since the 70s. He's written many books. Uh, many interdisciplinary books. He, um, and I think that will be a sort of a nice transition, as from this morning and just what we heard, people are involved and people engage and people do things in smart cities. And I think when we talk about people, it's important to talk about their perceptions, their cognition, their cognitive biases, their activities and actions based on information um, and the value um, and the informative content of information uh, as opposed to just data, uh, which we talked a lot about today. So um, with this, I would like to set the stage and hand over you to you all. You can continue a little bit. And uh, just to have okay. you uh, th uh, drink a little bit before and getting strong again. Uh, so thank you very much for coming, Yuval. It's a pleasure to introduce you. Thank and, you, uh, Farah, for uh, the introduction. Thank you. And uh, I would like to thank uh, Harold and the organizer for the invitation. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. And uh, I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about the smartification of cities, not so much about smart cities. And let's start with a question. If, uh, are smart cities uh, wise? And there are certain answers to this, to the distinction between... Uh, the smart guy and the wise guy. And the smart always manage to get out of a problematic situation. The wise never gets into a problematic situation from which the smart always manage to get out. <laughs> okay, so, uh, and you have this uh, idea in several uh, versions, one by Einstein, one by, uh, in Perkei uh, Avot, in the Jewish tradition, by uh, Ben Zoma, you would say, who is wise? One who learns from uh, every man. So, uh, who is wise and who is smart uh, city? And uh, a smart city uses uh, information communication technology to solve uh, problems. A wise city learns from all other cities how to avoid problems. Uh, and what, uh, in fact, in this is, if this is the situation, what can cities uh, learn from all other cities? they can learn that the smart city is a mislead, misleading uh, notion uh, for several reasons. One, that for the first time, it, there is an assumption in it that for the first time in human history, cities are smart. There is an assumption that uh, smart science can solve uh, all urban problems. Uh, that uh, smart information city can replace uh, the stupid uh, energy city, and that today's cities can be dichotomized uh, into smart versus uh, dumb cities. Now, all those uh, implications, and many others like, do like this, uh, are a mistake. One, cities, if you know a little bit of history, were always smart. The first city who came to the world more than 5,000 years ago came with uh, one of the most smartest uh, or wise, a invention uh, of human society, which is writing. And uh, during the uh, Greek period, uh, the city came with the notion of democracy and citizenship. And then in the Renaissance, art and architecture, the industrial evolution with industrial cities. And today, we have cities with information communication technology. Uh, now, if we return to the second uh, item, uh, the first scientific culture of cities actually uh, happened uh, before uh, today. In fact, uh, 
In the 50s and 60s, we have uh, a kind of uh, first wave, uh, first wave of uh, smartification. Uh, not unlike today, as it says here, the scientific community in the 50s and the 60s believed that by means of uh, the new computers that at that time came into uh, uh, operation in the domain of planning, that by means of uh, mathematical uh, models that were developed intensively at that time, and by means of uh, data uh, that was called just data, not yet big, uh, it will be possible to solve all urban problems. And the goal was uh, efficient city, not smart city, very similar. And the means were all those uh, fantastic uh, scientific uh, inventions, uh, quantitative methods, uh, the whole period is called the quantitative revolution, urban simulation models, uh, interdisciplinary uh, planning teams, uh, suburbanization, separation of land use, uh, and so on and so forth. But there were a few others during that time uh, that uh, thought uh, a bit different. The expectation, as you can see from uh, this uh, slide, were very high. But, as I said, there were a few who suggested something different. One of them was uh, Jean Jacobs uh, with uh, her little book, but very influential one, The Death and Life of uh, Great American Cities. In retrospect, we know that uh, she, was, uh, she was right. She was right in the sense that the attempt to uh, tame the city or to tame the metropolis and the attempt to solve all urban problems by means of uh, uh, scientific methods and the data and so on and so forth end up with a disaster from the point of view uh, of cities, so much so, so that today, actually, one of the <coughs> challenges of urban planning is to correct the mistakes of the 50s and the 60s. Uh, and today, once again, we have a second wave uh, of uh, fascination with scientific uh, urban revolutions under the title of uh, smart cities. So this is the second. As for the third idea that smart information uh, cities can replace the energy cities, the basic idea here that uh, instead of uh, the outcome, the energy city of the Industrial Revolution, we can now uh, build a city which is based on information. Uh, and the idea that information can replace energy is an old one. You might all uh, be familiar with uh, the so-called Maxwell uh, demon that was supposed <coughs> to uh, contradict the second law of thermodynamics and, in a way, uh, replace uh, energy. And uh, there is a lot of literature about this issue until today. Uh, but uh, as we know, uh, this is a bit uh, a naive idea and the basic idea or the basic conclusion here is that the smarter a city is, however you, how, however you define it, the higher the amount of energy it consumes. Uh, so, uh, on the other hand, uh, if we are uh, still talking about information, it must be emphasized that uh, by means of uh, different behavior, energy, as we know, can be saved, like in, with the idea, think global and act uh, local. Now about uh, uh, the fourth issue, today, all cities, in fact, all human settlements, are in the middle of a uh, process of smartification. Uh, not because uh, some uh, mayor or some uh, <coughs> city leaders have decided to smartify their cities, but because society at large is undergoing a, a process of uh, smartification uh, in the sense that uh, information communication technology actually are entering every sphere of life. Okay, so uh, uh, why, the, why the fuss? Uh, why quite a fuss is made 
of the possible introduction of uh, information communica communication technology, uh, Internet of Things and the rest, into cities, where, if not in big cities, such new technologies are being to be uh, implemented. Specifically so, today, when more than half of uh, human society uh, lives in cities and the trend is, uh, is uh, on its way. One answer to this question is uh, the so-called Industry 4 point, the fourth industrial revolution, and the basic idea that since the beginning of the 18th century, uh, with the Industrial Revolution, we had four such uh, revolutions. Okay, when the fourth one is the revolution of today, the cyber physical uh, system that enters uh, into every sphere of life. And the basic idea here uh, that we are uh, uh, on the edge of a major uh, change, first in industry, second in society, and in the same way, of course, uh, in cities. And this is a question of today. Uh, and the question is, are, are we really standing on the brink of a technological urban revolution that will fundamentally alter the structure of cities? Uh, the way uh, we live, the way we work in them, and the ways people in cities relate to each other. So this is a big question. And actually, if you follow the smart cities uh, discourse, uh, it's all about that, okay, uh, to clarify the potential of, of uh, uh, introducing new technologies uh, into cities. On the one hand, uh, you have uh, people who uh, see here a great opportunity, who are very enthusiastic that by means of those new technologies, we will be able to solve most urban uh, uh, questions, okay? This is a kind of uh, urban utopia. On the other hand, you have the pessimist, if you wish. Uh, they are skeptic about the possibility. They are skeptic about the new uh, uh, technology. They uh, see here uh, a situation that might uh, lead into an Orwellian a nightmare by which the big brother might be a, a government of a city, uh, of a company that is going to control the life of every uh, human being. So, the situation is the same in one of the most uh, dominant uh, domain of uh, urban research. I'm referring to uh, the so-called CTC, complexity theories uh, of cities, theories that treat the city as a complex, self-organizing system, open system, uh, complex in the sense that uh, it has non-causal uh, uh, event, it has uh, the property of self-organization, fractal structure, uh, chaotic behavior, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> now, here too, the tendency, the tendency is uh, to see the introduction of uh, the new technology uh, as an opportunity to make our models much more accurate and, and to, make, to make our planning uh, system uh, even more efficient. Uh, now there is a, uh, and actually it's a central way to cope with the complexity of cities. Uh, but there is a little problem here because one of the lessons that we learned from complexity theory uh, is uh, because cities are complex system, they are in principle, uh, uh, in principle unpredictable. Uh, and this is uh, so, not because lack of data, but because this is their very uh, nature. Uh, so, what is missing, I think, uh, in this uh, overall framework of smart cities uh, is a discussion about the implication uh, of smart cities or the implication of the introduction of uh, new technologies uh, into our cities. Okay, so uh, this is the challenge. Uh, and uh, here, what I would like to do, I would like to make a 
little attempt, preliminary attempt, uh, to meet this challenge by looking at smartification from two theoretical perspectives. And their uh, combination. One is the notion of uh, synergetic inter-representation network. The other one is information adaptation. Uh, now, the, both terms uh, comes or started from the introduction of cognition into the complexity uh, theories of cities uh, discourse. And the question is, why do we need a complexity when we deal with cities as uh, complex systems. So this is the starting point, and the answer to it is the following. Uh, most studies, or actually most uh, advance in the domain of uh, complexity theory was based on natural systems. And uh, uh, the idea here is that human beings differ uh, from uh, natural organic systems, and for several reasons. Or the main one uh, is that uh, organic systems undergo a process of evolution, as suggested by Darwin. Uh, human beings, of course, undergo a process of evolution, like other animals, but humans also undergo a process of cultural evolution. Now, uh, natural uh, uh, Biological evolution, for instance, is a very, very slow process. Cultural evolution is a very fast process. And uh, this has to be taken into consideration when we deal with a, a complex system like a city, uh, uh, which is uh, uh, basically a cultural uh, entity. Okay, so now a city, from this point of view, is what we can call hybrid complex system. It's a system composed on the one hand, on artifacts, like buildings, roads, etc., etc., and artifacts are by their nature simple systems. They might be very complicated, but essentially they are simple systems, like machines. So what makes the city a complex system is not the artifacts, but the human being uh, who uh, actually may connect an uh, uh, artifact, may make a... May can make a connection between artifact and their environment and all the other aspects that are needed for uh, complexity. Now, in order to understand how human beings behave apropos in space, this was the last question uh, of your previous talk, in order to understand that, we have to uh, turn into the domain of cognition, spatial cognition or cognition in general. And when we do so, we learn a lot. We learn that human behave in space not according to the structure of the space, but in, uh, according to, let's say, their cognitive map of it. And we learn a whole set of uh, a, a very uh, uh, interesting properties that I will not uh, elaborate on here. But one thing is interesting when you turn to, complex, to uh, cognitive science, which is uh, somehow artifacts uh, are out of the game. Artifacts are considered something which is external to cognition. And this, this is a, a, an idea that is uh, more general in science. There is a beautiful book by uh, Herbert Summer, Simons, The Sciences of the Artificial, and in there he writes the term artificial had a, a pejorative air about it. Now, just uh, this section by uh, uh, Noam Chomsky speaks about language. Noam Chomsky is one of the persons who originally developed the, the, the science of cognition. Now, Chomsky here makes a distinction between what he calls e-language, which is external language, uh, which, are the, which is the languages, actually, that we are talking, English, uh, German, uh, Spanish, uh, Italian, and so on and so forth, and i-language, which is internal language, which is common, according to him, to every human being. Okay? And what he says here that external languages are not interesting because they are not a natural entities. And this is a good reason to push them out or push their study out of the domain of uh, real uh, 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 cognition. Now, I agree with Chomsky that the languages are uh, artifacts, 
But I don't think he's right when saying that they are not interested, not interesting. Uh, they are and for several reasons. For one thing, uh, language uh, is similar to city in the sense that it's a complex self-organizing system. Second, similarly, uh, uh, it is a, a hybrid a complex system, specifically if you look at uh, a language with its uh, uh, ability uh, to write. So, what we are trying to do at a quite early stage, uh, we are trying to develop a concept of uh, cognition that includes artifact in it. And this is what uh, we refer to it as synergetic interrepresentation network, as let me describe it to you uh, briefly. The basic idea is that humans come to the world with a capability for representation uh, that takes two forms. One is internal, uh, uh, internal form, and this is what is called in cognitive science internal representation that takes place actually in the brain. So we can internally represent uh, uh, visual uh, entities, vocal, haptic, and so on and so forth. And then we also have a capability for external representation. Okay? We can externally represent our ideas. Uh, A, by means of the body, dancing if you wish, and also by creating artifacts. Okay? And the artifacts, uh, bodily, I mean mimetic, lexical, etc., artifacts can be tools, but also they can be a whole cities. Okay, so the city is, in a way, external representation of this kind. Now, this uh, capability enables us to solve a, 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 a very complex uh, cognitive task. For instance, look at a simple uh, process like multiplication. How do we solve it? We solve it but by an interaction between internal representation and external, because we cannot, we can easily multiply, let's say, 2 by 6. We can still multiply, let's say, 7 by 15. But when it comes, we go one step above that, we are stuck. What do we do? We start to play internal-external. We write it down, we externalize the, the, the question. And then we do one operation, externalize it. A second operation, externalize it, and so on. By means of internal-external representation, we can solve a highly complicated uh, uh, mathematical uh, problems uh, uh, like that. Now here, this is a very technical process of internal-external representation. But if you look at art, this becomes, uh, uh, di it's different, because uh, it uh, very much depends on the, on, the, on the individual, on the imagination of the person. On the left, you can see a very famous piece of work of uh, uh, Brancusi, uh, uh, the Romanian uh, sculpture that was working in Paris, okay? In 1907, he made the first, uh, if you wish, external representation of the kiss. Then, from year to year, he was working on it. And each external representation gave him a kind of, uh, a kind of a trigger to develop a second one, and a third one. And then, in 1937, uh, 30 years later, he was asked to, to, to uh, design a gate to a public uh, uh, park in, uh, in uh, Romania, and he created what he called the Gate of Kiss. Now, as you can see, during time, the, the, the two eyes of the man and the woman became something ge geometrical. And this happened because this internal-external representation. Now, if, you, if there are architects among you or are people who are uh, uh, engaged in design, this is very natural. You, you draw something, it enables you to think further. You, you think further, you draw it, you can go on. Or if you write something, if you write a text, or if you write a story, if you, uh, you want to, 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 uh, to create a melody, in all those cases, you work internal, external representation, okay? And basically, uh, the idea originally 
uh, came to us, us, I mean, uh, uh, Hermann Hacken, Professor Hermann Hacken for Stuttgart and myself, came to us uh, uh, through the work of uh, Bartlett uh, about, uh, in his book, uh, Remembering. <coughs> and we have developed for it a whole uh, a formalism, mathematical formalism, I will not go into it, but uh, what you see on the bottom right, this is the outcome of this, of this uh, conceptualization, and the basic idea here that every person, in this case agent in the city, is subject to two flows of information. One that comes from the city, or comes from the world. Another one that comes from the person's uh, brain. And the interaction between those flow, two flows of information give rise, on the one hand, uh, goes as a feedback, back again to the brain, and uh, externalized in the form of uh, behavior and action in the world. And when we deal uh, with cities, it's an action in the city. And uh, we have further developed uh, uh, this model into three sub-models. The one speaks about what is called the intrapersonal uh, process by which a person works with uh, him or herself to design something. Uh, there is another one which is called interpersonal, which has to do with uh, diffusion of, of uh, idea or diffusion of uh, artifact or diffusion of product between one person to the other to the third. And then there is a process that we uh, uh, term collective, which is a situation by which this play between internal and external uh, is happened simultaneously when many people participate in the problem, and this is very close to urban uh, dynamics, and uh, <coughs> we convey it by means of a city game, uh, which we have developed. Okay, and there is, as you can imagine, also formalism for these uh, uh, three sub-models. Uh, now, let's uh, uh, talk about the second concept, information adaptation. Now, if you ask, what are representations in the internal-external uh, game? And the answer is, representations are entities that convey information. Now, the question is, what is information? Uh, and here, uh, we started by looking at the theory of information that was formulated by Claude Shannon uh, in the end of the 40s, 48 and then uh, uh, 49. And Shannon uh, defines, and this is a bit uh, counterintuitive, Shannon defines uh, information as a pure quantity, irrespective of meaning. Uh, for instance, if you look uh, uh, at a dice, uh, it has uh, uh, six possibilities, okay? And you can, you can, you can quantify, by means of uh, Shannon bits, uh, how much information is conveyed by, by this uh, action. Okay, so uh, this was... Uh, uh, one definition, the, the more uh, common mathematical uh, uh, definition of it, you can see it up there, and as the uh, sentence say, below says, it is hard to exaggerate the importance of Shannon information. Since the 40s until today, it is at the center of uh, many, many sciences, including the whole idea of information communication technology uh, today in the context of uh, smart uh, cities. Now, a uh, uh, short time after Shannon wrote his uh, information uh, uh, theory, uh, there were several applications to uh, psychology and uh, uh, cognition. Uh, here are two uh, famous ones. One is the work by uh, Miller in '56, uh, the magic number 7 plus minus 2, some limitation on our capacity for processing information, you have to add in short-term memory. Okay, so, so uh, and, and what you managed to show, that this is, uh, we can measure the amount of information that our brain is capable of processing in short-term memory. You know, there is a distinction between short and long-term uh, uh, memories. So this is one. Another one uh, uh, was uh, made in the domain of uh, Gestalt. And what uh, those guys were able to show, that abstract object, abstract geometrical object, convey information, 
that we can quantify. Okay, so if you look, for example, at a circle and this L shape. A circle, if you rotate it, will always uh, remain a circle. The L shape, if you rotate it, will take different forms. So the L shape convey more information than the circle. Okay, now based on the, or inspired by this idea, Hermann Haken and myself took the same idea, the basic idea here, into the cities. And we said, okay, let's try to see how much information is conveyed by different cities. And here are a very simple example that show that this is possible. For instance, if you have a city where all buildings are identical to each other, okay? And you measure it by means of Shannon, like uh, top left here, for instance, if you measure it by, shop, by, by means of Shannon, Shannon, the information is zero. If you turn to a city where each building is different from all other buildings, the information is huge in terms of Shannon, which is why in the domain of spatial cognition, it is important to, to, to add, or in the context of a city, it is important to add landmarks, because all the rest are treated as, as, a, as something common, okay? But land, landmarks, once again, uh, should be uh, uh, distributed in space in a proper way, because if they come together, as, uh, uh, as here, they became one, and again, the information uh, uh, goes, uh, goes down. By the way, uh, top right is an example to a city where there is a lot of information. Uh, bottom left, this is Siena, where... Uh, the, the, the tower, the center, is highly informative, if you wish, but if you look at the neighboring city, uh, San, uh, sorry, San Gimignano, on the right-hand side, there are so many towers, and they add nothing to the information, okay? The only, only thing that you can know that this is essentially San Gimignano. Now, following Shannon, because he was focusing on, on uh, quantitative uh, information, there were attempts to develop uh, uh, concepts of uh, semantic information. At a, a, bit, uh, uh, a little bit later in time, uh, uh, to develop a concept of uh, pragmatic information. Semantic refers to meaning per se, okay? Uh, uh, whereas uh, pragmatic, still, uh, it's a qualitative uh, term, but it refers to the action conveyed by a certain object, okay? Uh, which is an uh, idea very close to uh, Gibson's notion of uh, affordances, okay? So I can say that this is a chair uh, in, in, the, in the abstract level, and that this chair convey uh, uh, the action of sitting, or what uh, uh, Gibson would call it affords a, a sitting. Now, uh, so, so, so uh, we went up till then, and then we realized when we were working about quantification that uh, something interesting emerged. And this something interesting is we realized that whenever we want to measure the quantity of information, the pure quantitative Shannon, we have to do some kind of categorization. All those buildings belong to one style, all those buildings to another style. Now categorization is by definition, uh, by definition implies uh, 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 giving meaning, okay? So uh, what we realize that meaning enters through the back door into the definition of uh, Shannon uh, information. And uh, uh, we started to, to uh, dig into this uh, uh, property and the result was a book uh, that is called Information Adaptation, the whole concept of information adaptation. Uh, and the basic idea here that uh, the quantitative and qualitative information, that is to say the Shannon information on the one hand and the qualitative information in the form of semantics or pragmatics on the other hand, they interplay in many, many cognitive processes. The very basic one is the process of seeing. Okay, uh, the process of seeing, uh, we now know, thanks to f uh, fantastic studies by uh, Hubel and Weisel and others, that it starts uh, bottom up. Uh, at the beginning, the brain uh, uh, actually uh, 
uh, deconstruct the information that comes, or the data that comes from the world. And then it creates a kind of uh, set of uh, uh, elements and then starts a top-down process by means the brain, uh, based on its uh, previous knowledge, previous memories, previous emotions, and so on and so forth, give rise or give meaning to this information. So we have this process of uh, bottom-up and uh, top-down, which is nicely captured by uh, uh, those of you who are familiar by the theory of synergetic. Ge uh, uh, generally speaking, data from the world uh, enter to uh, the brain, uh, is being transformed into uh, syntactic information, Shannonian one. This uh, uh, local Shannonian information triggers a top-down uh, uh, pro uh, process by means of... Uh, which uh, the brain uh, pattern recognizes what is in front of, uh, uh, of us. Okay, this is one uh, aspect of the uh, process. The second aspect is that uh, we, we uh, learn that this is implemented, this uh, top-down process is implemented in two different ways. Uh, sometimes when the, info, when the data that comes from the world is too little, the brain adds data that doesn't exist in reality. And, and this is what we call, we, we call it information inflation. In some cases, the data that comes from the world is too, is too much. In this case, the brain does the exact opposite. It ignores a lot of it. Okay? If you want example of the first, look uh, uh, bottom left. Okay? You see a black triangle. There is no black line there. And still you see, because the brain added uh, data. And if you look at the Olympic uh, uh, rings, uh, you see five circles in superposition. But there can be many other forms here which are not circles, okay? Uh, and this is the very famous uh, monkey business that you can see uh, in the internet. There is no time for, uh, to see it here, by which we, we, we look at the sen here uh, as a process, and people most... Uh, 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 more than half uh, of, the, of the people who see it do not see the gorilla who come into the center and do like this and go to the other side because we, the brain concentrates on a certain thing. So every piece of data which is irrelevant is, is pushed aside. Okay? And this is information deflation. In a way, what the brain does... Uh, is something similar to a puzzle. It takes a whole picture, cut it into pieces, and then start to assemble them uh, back together. And the question is, why? Why the brain needs to do so? And the answer is that usually, when we face uh, the environment, when we face reality, we never see full object. We never see the entire object. And always, we see only part of a whole, and the brain complements uh, uh, the rest. So, uh, so actually, what, we, what you can see is that the notion of information adaptation uh, complement the notion of uh, SIRN, and we have developed uh, uh, several uh, concepts uh, uh, along this uh, line. Uh, there is no time to go uh, into all of them. What I want to elaborate here is to show how this play takes place uh, in a city. Okay, now if you look uh, at the... At the uh, I'll give you a few examples. This is the best way to do it. For example, you have a city where all buildings uh, are identical to each other, zero information. If you cut, you categorize the city, as in uh, many places, let's say New York City, into uptown, midtown, and downtown, you immediately increase the information. If, on the other hand, all buildings are different from each other. The information is huge, Shannon speaking. Uh, uh, then, by categorization, you do the exact opposite. So you have inflation and, and deflation. So this is one example. Another example might be uh, like this. Uh, every element in the, in the city, every building or neighborhood, uh, convey what can be called syntact syntactic information as defined, let's say, by the city planner, okay? Now, this uh, building 
uh, conveyed uh, the, the function of a warehouse. So this is one way. The information here is actually zero, as defined by, by the city planning uh, authority. But imagine uh, that you are a, a poor artist, okay? Desperately looking for a place to live, a, a, a shop, and a studio to work. And you look at this same building, and actually you see three possibilities, not as defined by the planners. You can see in your imagination, you can see a nice apartment, you can see a, a, a nice studio, and you can see a, a nice shop all in this one huge space. So what do you do? You uh, rent or, or buy this space, and you turn it into what eventually uh, is, was called loft. Okay? Now this was done uh, uh, in the, in the, at the beginning, in the 60s, against the law. It took the planning authorities of New York 20 years to legalize uh, the lofts and to make the loft an a integ integral uh, part of the, of the city plan. Okay, so you have here what in complexity theory is called the bottom-up process that forces the authorities to, to, to change the city <coughs> in, a, in a, a certain uh, way. Actually, a similar process... Uh, and, and th these are lofts that became, you know, very fashionable, and uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, literature about it, and so on, and so forth. A similar process, by the way, took place in, uh, in Tel Aviv, uh, and here, uh, people in the 50s started to, uh, a person, one person in the city started to close the balcony, and until, uh, and in very short period of time, this became very popular, everybody started to close balconies, the municipality says, if this is the case, we are going to tax balconies as if they are the apartment. And then developers stopped building balconies. And so it went, uh, and, then, uh, the, uh, the, uh, and then architects wanted to build balconies, so the government say, okay, you can build it, but not in a way that will be enable the owner to close it. So they created what we call jumping balconies on the right-hand side. Okay? And this is something that you will not see anywhere in the world. But what is interesting here, that all this started with a single person in the 50s who decided to close here or her a, a, a balcony. So you can see that a lot of urban dynamics emerges a, a bottom up. And in time, a <clears throat> became part of the, of the city as a whole. Now, from the point of view, from the point of view of uh, this conjunction uh, between uh, SIRN uh, and information adaptation, uh, what emerges is that the city, uh, as I said, is a hybrid complex system. It is composed of artifacts on the one hand and a human being on the other hand. As we could see, artifacts convey information, uh, convey data, that humans, the urban agents, by means of their uh, mind, brain, uh, transform it into uh, Shannon information, semantic information, and pragmatic information. Now, in this process, sometimes there are kind of, uh, how to call them, creative uh, uh, I don't want to say creative destruction, which is a term of by Schumpeter, but creative uh, uh, acts which are against the law. Okay? Now, these are kind, if you look at them, uh, uh, from the point of view of complexity or even evolution, you can treat them as a kind of mutations. Now, in certain periods, such mut mutations will be cancelled. But in certain periods, a mutation will take over and will, uh, will undergo a process of spatial diffusion and will become a, or, or will create a phase transition in the, in the, uh, in the uh, evolution uh, of a city. And uh, to see how, you can see uh, in this uh, illustration, uh, actually, when we look at the long durée, so to say, a, a evolution of cities, we can see long periods of uh, steady state, short periods of uh, 
strong fluctuation and chaos, and again, a steady state and so on uh, and so forth. Now, during the steady state, there are all the time fluctuations. But as long as the city can uh, absorb those uh, fluctuations and actually, to use uh, uh, the, the term from synergetics, enslave them, the system will remain uh, in, in, in a structural stability. But if the system enters a certain difficulty, if the system becomes unstable for, then, and there might be several reasons, then, then a small fluctuation, like closing a, a balcony or like uh, transforming a warehouse into a loft, can have a major effect uh, 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 on a city. And this is actually what happened uh, in uh, in the case of uh, Tel Aviv and New York and uh, many other cities. Okay, now uh, let us uh, go back again to smartification. Now, if uh, we look historically at smartification, smartification is uh, actually uh, the current state of a very, very uh, uh, ancient, I would say, process of the production of artifacts. A process that accompany human, ev a human evolution from uh, uh, early days. And in this process, we humans produce uh, two kinds of artifacts. We produce uh, singular artifacts, like knives, uh, pottery, and so on, uh, stone knives in the past. Uh, and we produce also collective artifacts. Collective artifact uh, is a village, a city, uh, and so on, uh, and so uh, uh, forth. Uh, so this is one statement. Now, singular artifacts can further be uh, divided into artifacts that complement or replace the human body. Clothes, uh, knives that replace the uh, nails, okay? So those artifacts somehow replace the natural uh, uh, capabilities of a human. Uh, and there are also artifacts that uh, externalize uh, human thinking or human imagination. Okay, if you look at paintings, text, books, all those are artifacts that extend or externalize or both uh, 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 the human mind. Uh, and nowadays, we simply have new kind of artifacts. We have artifacts that have the capability to learn and to complement or replace human decision making. Okay, like... Uh, a self-driven uh, self, uh, uh, car, for instance. And we can uh, continue with this uh, categorization. Uh, okay, collective artifacts can further, further be uh, uh, categorized into artifacts that replace the human environment, villages, cities, and so on, artifacts that externalize human thought, and those are collective, like uh, writing, okay, uh, or, or language. And nowadays, once again, smart artifacts that learn and complement uh, in, the, in the public sphere uh, human decision-making, uh, for instance, in the domain of uh, uh, governance. Uh, what remains to be seen uh, today is how uh, nowadays smart artifacts will be incorporated into cities. We do not know much about that. Uh, how smart artifacts that can learn, that can take decision, and so on and so forth. Based on past experience, uh, we can uh, imagine several uh, scenarios, okay? Uh, for example, if you look at the car, okay? At the beginning, it was cities were without cars. There were engines and there was the city. Then cars were invented and there were humans, there were cars, and there was the city. Uh, at, the, at the last at the stage of this uh, process, actually, the cars became part of the city. Okay, just look at the following. Okay, this, this is how a, a, a city used to be. Uh, a street in a city, typical street used to be. This was a street. Today, this is a street. And today, when you encounter a street like the one on the left, you say, this is an empty street. Why empty? Because cars became an integral part of the urban landscape, integral part of, of, the, of, the, of the street, okay? 
Now we can apply it also uh, if, uh, to, to, uh, uh, to smart machines. Okay? We can imagine a process by which smart machine uh, at the beginning, and we are now at the beginning, will be something external to uh, humans and the city. Then gradually, smart machines will become part of the city. Like, think about elevator, okay? Elevator today is part of a building, even though it's, it's something uh, uh, independent. Okay, so this is one, if you wish, possible uh, option. There can be another one that uh, uh, up till now, uh, since their emergence 5,000 years ago and a bit more, uh, cities were composed of artifacts on the one hand and human agents on the other hand. So, as I said before, they were hybrid complex systems in the sense I have described before. Nowadays, if indeed uh, uh, thinking machines will enter uh, uh, the city, we will have actually triply a hybrid uh, uh, complex uh, system. We'll have artifacts on the one hand and we'll have uh, natural agents on the, on, the, uh, on the second hand and we'll have artificial agents as a third party. So this is a second possibility. And of course, there might be uh, many other uh, unforeseen uh, scenarios, unforeseen consequences of uh, uh, smartification. Apropos unforeseen uh, consequences, it's a concept that was suggested uh, some years ago by the sociologist uh, uh, Merton. Uh, now, uh, our recent studies about uh, complex systems in general and uh, complex uh, cities, more uh, specifically, uh, from this domain of study, we now know that the phenomenon on unforeseen consequences is a basic property of complex systems and of cities at, as complex systems. Uh, and uh, and uh, a case in point is the effect of, uh, for example, innovation on individuals, the human engine. And in fact, uh, this, uh, this uh, phenomenon of unforeseen uh, is one of the reasons that innovations are commonly accepted with mixed feelings. On the one hand, enthusiasm about their potential and prospects. On the other hand, uh, discontent and even fear regarding their possible effects. Uh, and the very famous uh, example of discontent uh, is uh, Socrates, uh, many years ago, uh, in Plato, there is a conversation uh, that starts with uh, Socrates, who uh, says, uh, you can see uh, the following. He says, actually, that writing is a terrible invention because people will use writing and will uh, stop using their memory. Eventually, everything will be written on paper and people will... Uh, uh, and, and, the, and the brain and mind and memory of people will, ga uh, be, uh, will uh, deteriorate. Uh, in reality, or in retrospect, we know that this concern about innovative artifacts, uh, uh, I mean, it was, uh, was, uh, was, uh, was not the case, okay? Because of internal-external representation, because externalization in the form of writing enabled us to, to think in a, in a much a longer uh, sequence. We have also seen before, I mentioned, uh, the discontent that uh, was uh, raised by, uh, by uh, Jean uh, Jacobs with uh, what we might now call the first wave of uh, smart uh, uh, cities. So, uh, that today again, we are facing a, a scientific urban revolution, uh, this time under the title of smart cities, and there are Various questions. Will the smartification of cities fulfill the expectations and will transform our cities into something fantastic? A sustainable, clean, quiet, just, uh, transparent, democratic, and uh, there is a long list. Or uh, will smartification lead to uh, an Orwellian uh, nightmare uh, with Big Brother controlling the life of uh, each of us? Will smartification of cities lead to a yet unforeseen consequence? Now, until we have a, an answer to all those questions, my recommendation is 
go to the sea, have uh, catch a fish, have a nice uh, deal, meal, uh, and enjoy life. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Yuval. But before you leave and uh, catch the fish, uh, we saw a couple of questions actually at the end. You may want to answer them or um, bring up a couple of notions, or you may have other questions. Please fire away. There's a question at the top. Blue goes with red sweater. Excellent. You. Hey. Ah. Um. Right at the very start, and stop me if that's too off thrust of your main topics, um, you, um, you brought up the Maxwell demon um, and kind of likened smart cities to it. Um, if I understood you correctly, saying that smart cities are necessarily more energy hungry than, well, a dumb whatever, not smart cities. Yeah. And while I can see that every IoT device, every smart meter needs energy, um, I find that hypothesis um, bold, let's say it. Um, how have you come to the conclusion that this is necessarily the case? How what, sorry? Uh, how have you come to the conclusion that uh, smart cities necessarily are more power hungry than not smart cities? Well, well information consumes energy, very simple. Uh, this is so with our body, okay? The brain, which is uh, 1 to 20 of our body, consumes 25% of our energy because it's a kind of computer processing machine. And the same when you need to produce information. Somehow it has to be, somewhere it has to be produced. We, we have just finished a, a project about electric vehicles. Now, of course, electric vehicles might uh, 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 make our cities much cleaner. But somewhere the energy that goes to, to the electric vehicle should be, should be made. Uh, so, I mean, uh, there is no uh, perpetua mobile. Uh, unfortunately, and, and uh, so, so uh, we have to take this into consideration very simply. So the, the question is how to, to, to uh, organize the production of energy in a clever way or in a smart way, if you wish. Okay. Anything else? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, perhaps I can add a thought to this um, question because I actually wrote down um, the same quote because I really like that you said um, it can help avoid energy waste by optimizing and changing the behavior. And yeah. I think that is a point that I am often missing in the smart city debate because the technology driven view is on um, optimizing efficiency, but actually we need to consider also sufficiency. And this is a topic in the sustainable um, research, but not so much in this tech-driven smart city research. Yeah, so. well, well, you see, in, in, the, in the, somehow, I don't know why, but in the debate uh, or in the discourse about smart cities, all, all uh, aspects of uh, urbanism comes, comes in. Uh, you can easily de uh, uh, develop a discussion or social discourse uh, about uh, energy uh, 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 or you can, you can develop uh, about, uh, about uh, uh, the quality of the environment without talking about smartification at all. I mean, this, this is not something that is essentially related to, 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 smart, uh, to smartification. This is something that you can discuss always. You could discuss it uh, 40 years ago without the idea of smart cities. And so, uh, with other questions that somehow are being uh, uh, dragged into, into the domain, for instance, social justice. 
and the city. Okay? In, in the early 1970s, David Harvey published a, one of the most influential books in the field, Social Justice and the City. Nothing was there about, about, about uh, smart machines or smart technology. Uh, uh, but social justice is a, is a very basic that human deal with, with or without technology or uh, sophisticated technology. So, so uh, obviously, there are many important questions in, in, in the domain of uh, citizen urbanism, but they, they are not automatically related to, to smart cities. I mean, smartification is not magic. Like, like transforming, uh, uh, <coughs> you know, like, like uh, get, getting green for, uh, from the production of energy. Smartification is, is something that has its own limitation, like every uh, uh, thing in the world. It's not, it's not uh, a magic uh, phenomenon. Perhaps I can add another question. Um, I thought it was very interesting how you talked about the city as, as an artifact and the, um, yeah, the agent, um, the person in the city or uh, the person living there. Um, I was wondering where you see the role of an administration or of city planning um, in this whole complex because I really think that relationship yeah. is very interesting but you didn't talk about what you as a researcher would recommend to city uh, planning. Yeah, well, you see, uh, we, we study cities from the perspective of, uh, as I said, complexity theory. Now, when you look at the city from the perspective of complexity, we see a notion, let's say, such as uh, self-organization. Uh, the first instinct is to say, okay, if the city can self-organize itself, who needs planning? But when you, look, when you look at urban dynamics a bit deeper, you realize uh, that actually in a city there is a lot of planning, much more than, than we, we actually uh, uh, assume. On the one hand, there are professional planners, city planners, who learn how to plan in the universities and so on and so forth. But from the point of view of cognition, and from the point of view of complexity and their conjunction, every person in the world is a planner at a certain scale. More than that, one of the basic uh, 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 capabilities of humans, and this is a, there is a, a, a book uh, uh, from uh, <clears throat> the early 60s, from 1960 actually, uh, one of the basic cognitive capabilities of humans is planning. Humans are planning by their nature. And recently, there are studies that show the, the neurological basis for this. And now we know that uh, uh, our brain has this capacity, which is called mental time travel. Our brain tends all the time to travel in time. Okay? Sometimes to the past, uh, we remember things that happened. And sometimes to the future, we remember things we, that have not yet happened. And many of our decisions in the present are based on this uh, 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 mental time uh, to the future. Actually, studies show that most of the time we are not here and now. Most of the time we either think of the past or of the future. Very, and just try to, just try to, to do meditation. And, uh, and try not to think about what happened or not to think about what might happen. Okay? So planning is a basic property of humans. And in a city, there is a lot of planning. Some of it is by professional planners. A lot of it is by the, by the citizen. And the story of the loft in New York and the, or the balconies in Tel Aviv, and there, are, uh, there is a whole list of stories like that, show that in many cases, because of the complexity of cities, a planning decision of single person might be more influential in the city uh, than a, a, a group of, uh, a huge group of professional uh, planners, okay? So I think one of the challenges, and this is not specifically related to, to smartification, one of the challenges today is to understand this kind of dynamics by which you have top-down planning, bottom-up planning, and how they interact.
While you think <coughs> of uh, your next question, I have a, a question, uh, you all. I find it really interesting, first of all, that you go first way back when, um, sort of in the notion to say, well, everything has been there, so it's yet another iteration. It's just a different uh, version of it, an evolu uh, in evolution, a changed version of it. Um, but it comes down to the human, to the individual, uh, basic cognition perception. Uh, we've seen a couple of th theories reviewed. And now this is the rhetoric that actually the big IT companies are using and saying, oh, it's the age of, age of cognition. We're building systems that are you know, replicating in a way, you know, doing cognitive um, doing cognitive decisions, perceptional um, uh, strategies, and we're building them in into the system so that we can help the humans sort of to do better decisions and so on. I wanted to perhaps if you could make sort of a couple of statements or, or relate to that notion that in fact now we are having this kind of uh, problem that you describe, you know, the limitation of the human brain and cognition to expand as rapidly as uh, artifacts can be made, but then this argument that, well, that's why we need the, the IT, uh, uh, information technologies to help the human actually cope with that. So this kind of, uh, you know, circular rhetoric in a way. Uh, maybe you can sort of, it's, it's, a, it's a broad and, and, and um, nebulous question, but I, I'm just curious what your thoughts are about this kind of uh, uh, interplay uh, of well, business and thing cognition. The to, to, uh, to answer is to say I don't know, <laughs> but, uh, I, I think that uh, this, is, uh, this is actually uh, maybe a bit uh, personal. I think that the interesting question about uh, nowadays uh, technology is uh, whether or not, or the extent to which it uh, will create a new kind of uh, agents in life, uh, since we are all living in cities, most of us, uh, in cities. This is an, an interesting question. Uh, if yes, this creates uh, a whole new world. It really might be a, a, a real a revolution, uh, urban revolution, if you wish. Uh, but it might just as well become uh, like an elevator, part of uh, a building or part of the city, like the car is today a part of the city. So, so uh, the answer is I, I, I really don't know, but it's... Uh, one, one of the good things in life is that uh, there is a lot of things that we don't know. So this is one of them, and there are, might be a nice expectation to see what will happen. Thank you. Okay. Further questions? Yeah, go ahead. One uh, thing I liked a lot about your talk is that you talked about artifacts as, uh, as um, parts of cognition, so yeah. that the... the the thinking that goes on uh, is not only happening in the brain, but also implies maybe also a much longer time frame. So we could right. look at the city as also as a memory, exactly. also of a very long term in a way. Yeah. Uh, memory. And I would be interested to. You also showed examples where uh, city infrastructures were completely changed and and for example, to adapt uh, for the car. Mm -hmm. And do you see a possibility in, in the new technologies to actually work around the physical substance of the city? Uh, and, well, and I, I think, as you said, I think, I, I think that, um, in a way, uh, the city uh, is a kind of uh, artifact that convey information about the past. Very simply, just categorize the city according to the age of the buildings. Uh, take uh, Zurich, okay? There are ancient buildings, modern buildings, so actually you can see a, a lot of human memory conveyed by, by the buildings. Uh, if you go to other cities, I, I now spend a lot of time in Venice, then uh, Venice is another uh, piece of memory, of human memory, a and so on and so forth. So, so obviously, uh, uh, artifacts, uh, in this case uh, cities, are a kind of, uh, I, don't, I, I don't think, uh, I don't want to use this concept collective memory, 
but just mm -hmm. between you and me, okay? We, let's talk about it as a, <laughs> as a collective memory. It can be treated as a, as a kind of memory of society or memory of some people in society. In this, in this case, uh, 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 collective. What will, uh, what will uh, new technology will add to it? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, as far as, far as uh, we can judge by looking at the past, it will somehow add another brick mm. on top of, uh, on, of what exists already. Another layer, uh, another aspect. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. What I was trying to say is that maybe if, you, if we implement new infrastructures in the past, we had to destroy big chunks of, of the city to implement these infrastructures. Yeah. And these might be new infrastructures that yeah, can but, but actually you know, if, be implemented. If you, look, if you look at the domain of uh, urbanism and, ci and city planning, uh, one, one of the... Uh, and architecture. One, one, of the, uh, one of the challenges is uh, what to do with the past. Okay? And it, it, appear, it appears everywhere. If you are an architect, then you have to add a new section to an old building. Uh, I just came to my mind the, the Stadt Gallery in Stuttgart. Okay? By Sterling. How do you do it? Do you do uh, a, a project which is similar to the past? Do you do something which is completely different? Uh, how do you combine the, the, the past and the, and, the, and the future? Okay? And th this is something that, I mean, uh, the, the ideas about it uh, are changing. During the first half uh, of the 20th century, actually until... until uh, let's say, uh, until the 70s, uh, during the period which, uh, in retrospect, we call modernism. The basic idea was, take away the past, start anew. Just think about the most influential uh, architect and uh, urban designer like Corbusier. Corbusier had the vision, he drew it, he made a drawing of it, uh, of Paris. All the beautiful Paris doesn't exist there, okay? It's just his uh, high-rises, what he called the uh, superblocks. Uh, fortunately, uh, no one in, in France uh, thought about uh, uh, implementing these ideas. There is one city in the world, Shandiga in, in India, where they followed uh, his uh, ideas, but this is a new city. So this... this uh, now, later, the idea of conservation and the idea that a city should, uh, or society, not a city, society should keep traces of the past within its uh, uh, present, this became almost uh, a, a very basic element in today's uh, city planning. Okay? Even... Uh, 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 so, so uh, and there is all the time discussion what to do with ancient buildings. And uh, so in every city, uh, there is another policy. But I think that today, people are not uh, are reluctant to get rid of the past. So the past is uh, present. If it will disappear in cities, it will remain in stories <laughs> and in paintings and uh, things like that. But the, the, isn't this there's an in, interesting distinction between history and memory here and whose past? Uh, and so we see this a lot. Um, I mean, I'll just a few examples from the United States in uh, getting rid of uh, Confederate statues, for instance, uh, and, the, and the conflict around that, yep. around having the Confederate flag flying over buildings or, or uh, actual buildings that have Confederate symbols in them. Um, you know, so, it, so the, I guess the question is, for some people, those symbols matter and they want to keep them, and for others, they're painful. And so when you think about the city and whose past and whose agency and whose memory, I wonder if you can reflect a little bit about how that works out. Yeah, there is a, a book which is called Whose City? Uh, and uh, it could just as well be called Whose Memory? 
I don't think that there is, that there is a, there, I mean, this is something that people all the time negotiate. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an ongoing uh, dilemma. And I don't think that there is a, a single absolute question to it. I think that from time to time, when the perspective is changing, the answer is changing. Uh, if you take the example you mentioned in the United States, some people want to get rid of them and not to see them anymore. But some people, from the very same point of view, not because they admire those guys, but they, they want, might want that, uh, that they will be seen so people will remember the bad things they did or, 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 or things like that. So, I mean, uh, uh, there are a lot of things that eventually uh, emerge out of, uh, you know, public discourse, social discourse uh, between people. I mean, not everything can be, can be, can be, uh, can be solved by, by uh, um, you know, a clever planner. In fact, uh, one of the most recent approaches to planning, <coughs> what is called collaborative planning or communicative planning, by Patsy Healy, for instance, in, in England, and Ines in the, in the United States, uh, takes the, the model of uh, Habermas, of, uh, of uh, social discourse, as a starting point for planning. And the basic idea that urban planning should evolve as a kind of public discourse, uh, which, in, in which there are, there are uh, people from the government, or from the public sector, there are people from the private sector, and there are people from the so-called cell sector, or what we call a, a civil society, NGOs and so on and so forth. So, so uh, <clears throat> nowadays in planning, this is the idea that a lot of such uh, uh, ethical, cultural and social questions uh, uh, must be solved by, by this ongoing discourse between, between all, all uh, sectors uh, uh, of society. So, uh... I don't see the boxes moving around. So, in terms of uh, keeping time, I would like to close this session. I would like to first thank uh, Joao Portugali for a very yeah. stimulating talk. Um, I would like to also uh, thank um, <coughs> Rob Cowley uh, for starting the afternoon session. I would like to thank you for coming and providing uh, further fuel, energy for the brain, uh, and to uh, generate more information and making us smarter about cities. And um, it's not over yet, so don't go away. So um, yes, it's, it's time to clap, actually, first. Thank you very much. Thank you.